good morning. Welcome to Central Church of Christ on a, a beautiful Lord's Day. We're glad that you are here. I don't know if you'll figure it out here in the next 10 or 15 minutes or not, but I think you'll see the theme of what Lyle's going to talk about. We're glad you're here. I could sing of your love forever. It's going to be our first song. Amen? All right, a great old hymn right now simply says, My Savior's Love. God's people said, what an amazing Savior we serve. All the power in the world is His, and we can have that if we understand His love and His power.
You know, the good old songwriters, when they put those chords and those words together, sometimes you can't even help but kind of get in a goosebump or two when we think about the love and the power of Almighty God. Oh, how he loves you and me. love him back. I We're going to dismiss just the we worship at this time. We worship. Kids, it's a good time to go, but junior worship, you get to stay with us today. As we go to our time of prayer, um, even at the first service, Lyle mentioned a whole long list of people needing prayer. We continue to remember Clarence in rehab, Clarence Maupin. Keep uh, people who've had surgeries recently, uh, Marvin Hewitt, keep Judy Smith in your prayer, keep Bob Hanson and Connie, they're up in Minnesota, his sister had a stroke, her name's Vanessa Wilson, keep uh, uh, 
Michelle's sister, Tammy, in your prayers, probably in her last couple days of life here on this earth, but just lift her up to, to just a lot of people to pray for. Merle Powell's going to have uh, knee surgery later this week, and uh, the list goes on. Kristen Whaley's going to get married. Oh, that's, that's, we need to really pray, right? There you go. She's had a good time. Her mom said, don't be hurrying up the time she's spending here. It's been fun having her home, I think, a couple more weeks, and she'll be going back to Missouri or Missouri, depending on where you're from. All right, let's just take a moment. You talk to the Lord, whatever's on your heart, and then I'll pray out loud. Father in heaven, uh, it's kind of nice to just stand here or sit there in the quietness of the morning and reflect on how much you love us, how great a God we serve. And Lord, may we, as we contemplate that fact, recognize the need for us to love you with all of our heart, with all of our mind, with all of our strength. Lord, today we lift up the list that I gave plus more who are just struggling to breathe. Uh, one I didn't mention, Gary Gorman's brother, Al, just can't breathe. Well, it's just a tough thing. Those who are facing their final days maybe on the earth, those battling cancer, those facing surgery, those having strokes, Lord, you're still an amazing God to help us and encourage us and be with us through it all. Today, Lord, we ask your special blessing on each person, but also now on this service that will be drawn close to your love in our love to you and our love to people. We thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. This next song... I call it Amazing Love. It's really titled, I think, You Are My King. It's really all about His love. We're going to sing it before the men come today. I'm forgiven because you were forsaken. I'm accepted.
I'll be reading from uh, Mark chapter 14, 32 to 38. Very familiar series of scriptures. And they came to a place called Gethsemane, and he said to the disciples, Sit here until I have prayed. And he took with him Peter and James and John and began to be very distressed and troubled. And he said to them, My soul is deeply grieved to the point of death. Remain here and keep watch. And he went a little beyond them and fell to the ground and began to pray that if it were possible, the hour might pass him by. And he was saying, Abba, Father, all things are possible for thee. Move this cup from me, yet not what I will, but what thou wilt. And he came and found them sleeping and said to Peter, Simon, are you asleep? Could you not watch for one hour? Keep watching and praying that you may not come into temptation. The spirit is willing, but the flesh is weak. Temptation, the thing that Christ warned them so strongly about. What is it? Webster says that it is to induce or to incite, entice, disposed to evil and uh, to be attracted, attractive to, allure, invite, and three, risk provoking, defy. Dispose of evil, to evil, defy. Christ tells us to keep watching and praying so that we don't become defiant and so that we don't give ourselves over to evil. While Christ was doing the job he had to do, he asked his disciples to watch and pray he knew that their flesh was weak and they would give in to sleep instead of watching and praying. You know, I, I think about this, you know, they were just tired, but Jesus gave them an assignment. They, unbeknownst, just watch. And what were they watching for? They were watching for those that would come for him. Verse, uh, Mark 14, verse 50 says that all left him and fled when danger came close, they ran away and left Jesus behind. They left Jesus behind. You know, when temptation or danger comes close, we run away sometimes too, don't we? We leave Jesus behind. The very thing that is our strength, we run away from. Not only do we run away from Jesus, we run into the very jaws of the devil. First Peter 5, 8 says, be on the alert your adversary, the devil, prowls about like a roaring lion, seeking someone to devour. The devil waits with open jaws, and Jesus waits with open arms. Jesus has opened the door to eternal life. He has already paid the ransom for our sins. Jesus paid the price with his life. Now let's try and honor him by giving him our lives. Give him the glory for everything. Go to him with every problem. Don't give yourselves over to temptation, fear, and doubt. Draw near to Christ. 
Be alert and pray always. 1 Peter 5.10 says, The God of all grace, who called you to his eternal glory in Christ, will himself perfect, confirm, strengthen, and establish you. Trust in Jesus, and he will do all these things for you. You know, you've uh, heard people ask, they've asked the question, how far from God can you get and still be in his grace? Have you ever heard anybody ask that? How far away can you get before you fall? I say, how close can you get to a lion before he devours you? Any of us that have ever been to the zoo, you go out and you see that big lion that's out there, and the more you look at him, the more you realize that fence isn't tall enough. You know, he looks right at you, and he, you know, I, th I sit there, the more I look in his eyes, I go, he's sizing me up. He is truly wishing that he could just get to me. You know, and that is just the way Satan is. He is like a lion that roar, you know, prowls around and seeking someone to devour. Let's not provoke the roaring lion to come our way. Be alert and pray always. Don't fall asleep when danger is near. When we partake today, remember that Christ instructed us to do this so that we won't be tempted to forget that Christ had to pay the price and that we need to cling to him and look to him for our every need. Let's pray. God, thank you today for protecting us from that roaring lion, for protecting us from the things that would destroy us or draw us away. And Lord, we just help us to remember always that what we celebrate here today was paid with a great price, with great pain. And we pray your blessings on the loaf and the cup today as we partake. Thank you. In Jesus' name, amen.
Good morning. As, as an operator three for the Scotts Bluff County Roads Department, uh, one of your requirements is that you know how to operate every piece of equipment that the county has. And uh, um, one of the hardest pieces of equipment that I recently just started learning how to run is the bulldozer. Um, uh, the dozer is a very power, powerful machine and is capable of doing things uh, that are really good and is capable of messing things up completely. Um, the, the dozer is pretty hard to operate because you have a blade in front of you that's 12 feet wide and 4 feet tall and you can't see a thing that you're doing in, that's going on in front of you. So you have to learn how to feel uh, the machine, what the machine is doing and, and uh, it, and for instance, uh, you can actually steer the machine with the blade as you're pushing. And uh, it, if you start to feel the machine drift into the right, you can lean towards the left and it'll actually pull it back straight and sometimes it'll actually send it to the left also. So you have to find that happy medium in there. You're just constantly adjusting your, pulling your joystick and, and, uh, and, and figuring out how, how to get it to push right. Um, and you also, you, you, feel, you can feel the machine if it stops moving, you know you're pushing too much material and you need to lift up a little bit and get it to push, you know, start tracking again. Uh, if, if you don't, it'll just sit there and spin and it'll actually dig, dig itself in and, and you'll end up getting stuck. But, um, and then also you have, to, you have to be able to feel the machine as it's going along, it'll drop down, come back up, and you have to adjust your blade accordingly in order to, to keep it from putting waves in whatever you're pushing. Because I don't know if you've ever ran a track machine, it's pretty rough as it is. Uh, and if you're putting a whole bunch of waves in there, it makes it really rough and you get bucked out of the seat pretty good when you're trying to back over the top of it again. Um, but the only reason that I mention that is the other day I was running the machine and uh, I was pushing up a whole bunch of clay in our pit out there by the high, old Highland School out there and uh, for a job that we're getting ready, I mean that, that we just finished on Friday and uh, I got to thinking about it and uh, I realized that we can be a lot like that bulldozer. We can, we're capable of doing really good things and we're capable of really messing things up. Um, and, and the spirit is like the operator as long as we're listening to his prompting and, and what, what, uh, what he wants us to do, he will never lead us astray. And if we're not connected to him, if we're not listening to him, we can really mess things up. But unlike the operator of the dozer, the spirit can see everything that we are doing what we have done and what we will ever do. We need to trust him and he will see us through. In Proverbs chapter 3 verses 5 through 12 says, Trust in the Lord with all your heart and do not lean on your own understanding. In all your ways acknowledge him and he will straight, make straight your paths. Do not be wise in your own eyes. Fear the Lord and turn away from evil. Honor the Lord with your wealth and then with the first fruits of all your produce. Then your barns will be filled with plenty, and your vats will be bursting with wine. My son, do not despise the Lord's discipline, or be weary of his reproof. For the Lord reproves whom he loves, as the father, the, the son in whom he delights. That also applies to our giving, whether it is of our time, our talents, or our treasures. Wherever we are being prompted by the Spirit to act, we need to act whether... Uh, if that is by uh, donating your time to accomplish the needs of the church or giving of your treasures to further the kingdom, uh, further the church and, and the kingdom of God, we need to do it. Colossians chapter 3, verses 23 through 25 says, Whatever you do, work heartily as for the Lord, not for men, knowing that from the Lord you receive an inheritance as your reward. You are serving the Lord Christ for the wrongdoer will be paid back for the wrong that he has done, and there, are, there is no partiality. Will you pray with me? Father, we just thank you for another day of life. We thank you for your love, your mercy, and your grace. We thank you, Father, that, that uh, 
no matter what, you'll never lead us astray. Father, we just ask that you be with us as we give of our tithes and offerings uh, offerings right now. Um, be with the gift, also be with the giver. It's in Jesus' name I pray. Amen. All right, we're going to test you a little bit today. As you give, would you stand with us? We're going to sing an old song, but maybe a new one for us. I'm in love with my Savior, and He's in love with me. He is with me from day to day. What a friend is He. Watches over me while I sleep. Hears me when I pray. I'm as happy as I can be, and I now can say, somebody loves me, and so is my friend. I love somebody, I know he cares, somebody tells me not to repent. That somebody is Jesus, and I know he's mine. You'll be happy. You will let Jesus have his way. He has work for us all to do every passing day. Feed the hungry and clothe the sad for the sinner pray. You'll have joy that you never had in you then. Can say, everybody, somebody loves me. Answer my prayer. Somebody. Somebody tells me not to reply That somebody is Jesus and I know he's mine Amen? You may be seated. Thanks for your singing. Karen said that Herb had picked a new song. She had never heard that one before. And I, my, my, first, my first thought was, did the Gaithers sing it? And she looked it up. Yep, they did. And I said, yep, that's where, that's where Herb got it. Right? Am I right? You, you learned it from the Gaithers. Yeah. And you guys picked it up pretty fast, actually. You got to clapping and, you know, even those that... You know, Central is a clap challenge church, and uh, even though some of you that never clapped, and you, I bet you your I bet you your foot was at least tapping. I'm guessing that's true. Hey, will you do me a favor? Um, for for those of you that are online, we we thank you for uh, being here. Um, and last week when I said uh, if you're online, uh, you can prove that to me by you know shooting me a text. Then I said Sarah Sanderson. Anyways, I appreciate that. I got back to my office. I had 16 texts last week. So there, there is a presence online. I appreciate that, uh, but I don't know who they are uh, unless you let me know who you are. So shoot me a text if you're online. I appreciate that. And the ones that I know for sure are going to be there are my in-laws. And so I think the camera, you know, sees this portion right here. I don't know if we actually see over here. But those of you that, like you, you guys right here, you wave, wave right now to my mother-in-law, my father-in-law. Yeah, thank, thank you. They, they appreciate you waving. Yeah, I don't know if they can see you or not, Stu. Okay, well, uh, yeah, I mean, there you go. Yeah, see, we're all happy to see your sister too. So, but see, you're on the wrong side of the church to be able to actually see her. So, anyway, yeah. The right hand of the Father. Yeah. Scriptural. Anyway. The fruit of the Spirit is love. The fruit of the Spirit, the product of God's Holy Spirit in us, inside us Christians, is first of all love. I don't think there is any characteristic which defines Jesus more completely than this one. But what is love? What is love? We hear it about it in many different circles, but I wonder how many really know what it is. 
we hear things like, love makes the world go around. We hear things like, all you need is love. Or, love will find a way. We talk about falling in love. We talk about staying in love. We talk about making love. We have bumper stickers with big red hearts. I love cats. Isn't that special? Now, if a cat runs in front of Mike Whaley, Mike Whaley speeds up. <laughs> I love cats. I love, here's one for Mike, I love motorcycles. I love, I love coffee. Yay. I love chocolate. And this next one, don't put it up there yet. This next one, I think I'm going to get this in a bumper sticker and put this on my daughter's first vehicle. I love my dad's jokes. <laughs> Ashton, are you looking forward to that bumper sticker on your stuff? I love my dad's jokes. But again, what is love? What is love? Is it an emotional feeling? Something we fall into or even fall out of? Is it a matter of the head or of the heart, uh, the mind or the emotions? The dictionary uses words like affection, attraction, and warm attachment, but even those seem a little vague to me. The Apostle Paul describes in 1 Corinthians 13, love is patient, love is kind, it is not jealous, love does not brag. It is not arrogant. It does not act disgracefully. It does not seek its own benefit. It is not provoked, does not keep an account of a wrong suffered. It does not rejoice in unrighteousness, but rejoices with the truth. It keeps every confidence. It believes all things, hopes all things, endures all things. Love never fails. It's interesting here, as we're trying to figure out what love is, it's interesting here that Paul uses quite a few words telling us what love is not. And then he tells us several things that love is. Jesus said, I am giving you a new commandment that you love one another just as I have loved you that you also love one another. By this all people will know that you are my disciples if you have love for one another. Now, if that's the case, that we are to love as Jesus did, then it seems obvious that true love, whatever it is, ought to look like Jesus. Well, now, Suddenly, new words are going to appear. New words come to mind like servanthood, sacrifice, unselfishness, and even suffering. That doesn't sound much at all like the love we see on TV or in the movies, but that is what Jesus modeled. The attention... Jesus showed to the woman at the well. Uh, the second chance he offered the woman caught in adultery. The compassion that he felt for the rich young ruler. The hope that he granted the thief on the cross. The love that he expressed as he gave his life shows us that Jesus is all about love. Jesus' kind of love is a huge challenge in our culture because many people think sex is love. And then after a while, their bodies begin to age or the, the thrill of being with someone sort of wears off and, and many who thought they were loved find themselves brokenhearted and alone. 
our, our culture thinks they know what love is, but, but the bottom line truth is that our culture is very misguided in many different areas. We read this in 2 Timothy 3, but mark this, there will be terrible times in the last days. People will be lovers of themselves, lovers of money, boastful, proud, abusive, disobedient to their parents, ungrateful, unholy, and then I underlined in my Bible here, without love, unforgiving, slanderous, without self-control, brutal, not lovers of the good, treacherous, rash, conceited, lovers of pleasure rather than lovers of God, having a form of godliness but denying its power, have nothing to do with those people. I don't know about you, but I've pretty much quit reading the news. Unfortunately, it used to be my favorite thing to get the daily, you know, the, the daily newspaper and, you know, read the whole thing. I've pretty much quit reading the news. I read a little bit on my phone. But for the most part, I'm really not up to date because I get so weary of hearing day after day abuse and evil people doing evil things. I get so weary of reading about all the different people groups so consumed with hatred toward people. So many stories of spouse abuse and child abuse and parents exploiting their children and caregivers who steal from the elderly and murderers and rapers and, and drug pushers and it just gets wearisome. I just get tired. And beyond those who aggressively bring harm, the fact is many of us selfishly live for ourselves and ignore the needs of others. It's not that most of us would ever hurt anyone intentionally, but we simply neglect opportunities to reach out to people in positive ways. The fruit of the Spirit is love. It has been said that a picture is worth a thousand words. You ever heard that phrase? A picture is worth a thousand words. So maybe the best way to define love is to look at a picture from the life of Jesus. So look at this picture in John chapter 8. If you have your Bibles, you can look at John chapter 8. We're going to look at about the first 10 verses. But in John chapter 8, we find Jesus facing a very awkward dilemma. The religious leaders, the so-called spiritual giants of Israel, had dragged a woman before him. Now, these men would have normally not given this woman the time of day, but, but Jesus was about to give her the best day of her life. It says in John chapter 8, verse 1, But Jesus went to the Mount of Olives, and early in the morning he came again into the temple area, and all the people were coming to him, and he sat down and began teaching them. Now the scribes and the Pharisees brought a woman caught in the act of adultery. And after placing her in the center of the courtyard, they said to him, Teacher, this woman has been caught in the very act of committing adultery. Now in the law, Moses commanded us to stone such women. What then do you say? These teachers of the law and Pharisees had come to Jesus, but were they interested in justice? or just eager to condemn, or even something else? Did they see this woman as a troubled sinner in need of spiritual guidance, or as a worthless sinner deserving of death? It's true. The Old Testament law listed adultery as a capital offense. But these men with rocks in their hands were ready to set themselves up as judge, jury, and executioner without so much as an attempt to understand her life or her pain. And she was caught in the very act. 
Now, without being offensive, not trying to be offensive, can I just say it cannot be very easy to catch somebody in the act of adultery? Unless they are extremely careless of where they choose to commit the act or a trap has been set to catch them. So a question comes to my mind, if this woman was caught in the act, where is the man? (laughs) Why didn't they drag him before the crowd to Jesus? Because the law of Moses said he was guilty and deserved punishment as well. Is it possible that the man who committed the act was in on the trap? Is it possible that the the man was someone important and he was not quite as expendable as the woman? Either way, or some other scenario, it all stinks because of what verse 6 says. Now they were saying this to test him so that they might have grounds for accusing him. This woman and her sin meant nothing to them. This woman and her sin meant nothing to these religious leaders. They couldn't care less if she were an adulteress or not. To them, she was a piece of meat. An insignificant pawn to a much larger game. This wasn't a trial. It was a trap. So what did Jesus do? He boldly confronted the Pharisees. And he said, and the verse says in verse 6 through 9, But Jesus stooped down and with his finger wrote on the ground. And when they persisted in asking him, he straightened up and he said to them, He who is without sin among you, let him be the first to throw a stone at her. And again he stooped down and wrote on the ground. Now when they heard this, they began leaving one by one, beginning with the older ones. And he was left alone, and the woman where she was in the center of the courtyard. As they pressed in around Jesus to hear how he would respond, he bent down, he started to write in the dirt with his finger. What did he write? Well, I think every one of us who have read this text have asked that question. I wonder what he wrote. The text doesn't really say. What did he write? And one of the things that I find interesting here is the Greek word used for write. It wasn't the simple term typically used. John attached a prefix to the word that could actually render it to write against. And many commentators agree that Jesus was probably in some way addressing the sins of the accusers. Maybe he was writing the Ten Commandments to remind them that all people are guilty of something. Maybe he was writing the specific sins of those standing there with stones in their hands. But whatever he wrote, rather than loudly announcing their sin and inconsistency, he quietly gave them the opportunity to be convicted of their sin and to leave the scene in humility. Did it work? It did not work. They did not back down. They kept pressing Jesus for an answer, so Jesus decided to be more direct. He who is without sin among you, let him be the first to throw a stone. In effect, Jesus was saying, go ahead and throw, but before you do, make sure you have never done anything for which you are ashamed. Make sure there is nothing in your past that only you and God know about. You want to kind of keep it that way. There's something, there's something fair about a level playing field, isn't there? The advantage of the Pharisees was suddenly taken away, and Jesus was no longer facing only a sinful woman, but he was facing a sinful crowd. And one by one, they got the hint. 
and turned away. Do you know what Jesus did? He freely forgave that woman. And straightening up, Jesus said to her, Women, woman, where are they? Did no one condemn you? She said, No one, Lord. And Jesus said, I do not condemn you either. Jesus forgave her sin, all the while knowing he would soon have to die for her sin. Unearned, undeserved, unbelievable forgiveness. The only one qualified to condemn her didn't. As we think about this account, I believe we will really begin to appreciate the hope that is offered to every person and be reminded that we can't earn salvation and we don't deserve to be forgiven. God freely washes us clean through the blood of Christ. We also need to understand that for this woman to be forgiven, that it all hinges on the last verse of the text. Go now and leave your life of sin. You see, the story wasn't complete until Jesus challenged her to repent. Forgiveness means responsibility. And that is why repentance literally means to make a U-turn. It's not just being sorry for your sin. It's being sorry enough to quit. Whatever that is. Varies for every one of us. Jesus did not simply tell the woman she was free and clear. He directed her to straighten out those things in her life that prevented her from having a meaningful relationship with God. He challenged her to make something better of her future. And the same is true for all of us. If if we want to be in a right relationship with God through Christ, we must repent And leave our old lives of sin behind us. I I try to remind people that we, you know, leave our sin behind when we're buried with Christ in baptism, risen to walk in newness of life. We leave that life of sin behind. That's Romans 6 language. Acts chapter 2 has a little bit of the same language. Therefore, let all the house of Israel know for certain that God has made him both Lord in Christ, this Jesus, whom you crucified. And when they heard this, they were pierced to the heart, said to Peter and the rest of the apostles, Brothers, what are we to do? Peter said to them, Repent. Repent. Change your mind. Change your mind about the things of this world. Change your mind about the way you're living. And look the other way. Go the other way. You turn your life. Repent, be baptized in the name of Jesus for the remission of your sins to receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. But as we think back to our text this morning and as we, as we think about our topic today of love, think about this text in John chapter 8 and, and we're, we're, we're thinking about what is love. The word love is not found in John chapter 8. You don't see the word love in John chapter 8. It, although it seems like it's revealed in nearly every verse. And it's that love that should flow through our lives as we allow God's Spirit to fill us, and to mold us, and use us. And so with the rest of our time this morning, I want us to just think about what should love look like in our lives? We saw a snapshot of Jesus, what love looked like in his life and account with the woman. But what does love look like for us? Well, first of all, love involves putting others before ourselves. 
Jesus could have easily sided with the Pharisees in order to protect his reputation. The crowds may have questioned his actions, but it would have been a lot safer in the long run. No need to make the establishment angrier than they already were. But Jesus always put others before himself. Paul says in Romans chapter 12, Be devoted to one another in brotherly love. Give preference to one another in honor, not lagging behind in diligent Diligence, fervent in spirit, serving the Lord, rejoicing in hope, persevering in tribulation, devoted to prayer, contributing to the needs of the saints, practicing hospitality. Get your mind wrapped around Romans 12 there and 10 through 13, and you'll begin to get a very solid picture of what love is. Philippians chapter 2, if any encouragement in Christ, if any consolation of love, if any fellowship of the Spirit, if any affection and compassion, make my joy complete by being of the same mind, maintaining the same love, united in spirit, tent on purpose, do nothing from selfishness or empty conceit, but with humility consider one another as more important than yourselves. Do not merely look out for your own personal interests, but also for the interests of others. Have this attitude in yourselves, which was also in Christ Jesus. When we love somebody, we ask, what's best for you? When we love somebody, we say, what can I do for you? When we love somebody, we say, how can I help you? We put ourselves in their place, and we try to see things from their perspective. We try to walk a mile in their shoes. Here's some advice. I don't know if this is good advice or not, but here's some advice. Before you criticize someone, walk a mile in their shoes. That way you're already a mile away and you have their shoes. There's an example of I love dad's jokes. Good stuff, huh, Sarah? Not that, sir. This, sir. Love means we listen. Love means we listen even when we are too tired or busy. We buy somebody a meal or visit them in the hospital or call just to say hello. We come to the defense of a co-worker who is being ridiculed. Maybe it's we take out our wife for dinner instead of staying home to watch a ball game. Here's something. Mother Teresa said, love, to be real, must cost. It must empty us of self. Secondly, love demands a willingness to face tough issues. Jesus openly confronted the sin of the Pharisees. He he also didn't let the adulterous woman off the hook, but commanded her to leave her life of sin. There's a common attitude in our culture among many today that says the only approach to those who behave immorally is to legitimize their behavior. You know, live and let live. Who am I to say that someone else's behavior is improper? If we refuse to condone what they do, we're obviously egotistical bigots with no concern for their well-being. Now, God, now, granted, God didn't commission us to condemn adulterers or liars or thieves or alcoholics. God didn't commission us to condemn them, but, that, but God did commission us to speak out against adultery, to speak out against lying and stealing and alcohol abuse. But notice the difference. We condemn the act, not the person. You hear me? We condemn the act. We speak out against the act, never the person. God loves sinners. God hates sin. 
There's an amazing verse in Proverbs 27, verse 6. Wounds from a friend can be trusted, but an enemy multiplies kisses. Wounds from a friend can be trusted. Sometimes the most loving thing to do is confront someone, even though that is very uncomfortable. The Bible says that we are to speak the truth in love. Avoiding confrontation for the sake of peace is not love. The Bible says love must be free of hypocrisy. Detest what is evil. Cling to what is good. Love requires, thirdly, a a forgiving spirit. With no strings attached, Jesus released this woman from the guilt of her past. In effect, he wiped the slate clean and promised to never bring it up again. That's hard to do. That's hard to do. It's human to hate. What did I say? It's human to hate. It's hard not to hate. It's hard to turn the other cheek, especially when we have been wronged. Our carnal nature wants to retaliate. When you deserve an apology, but an apology hasn't been offered, it's hard to let go of a wound. The most natural thing in the world is to hold a grudge. But Christians live on a different plane. We live by a different standard. We, we have a different worldview. That, that word came up today in Sunday school. We have a different way of thinking, a different way of, of, of uh, approaching life. So in this context... The Christian way is do not be overcome by evil, but overcome evil with good. Forgiveness does not mean we forget the pain. It does not mean we automatically trust the person again. Forgiveness simply means we give up our right to get even. We refuse to let bitterness control our lives. We look at other people, even those who have hurt us deeply, and try to see them through the eyes of Christ. Our only chance to really forgive like that is to turn the hurt over to God. The Bible says, be kind to one another, compassionate, forgiving each other, just as God in Christ also has forgiven you. The Bible says, love keeps no record of wrongs. And number four, love persists through all circumstances. Love always protects, always trusts, always hopes, always perseveres. Love never fails. I read of a minister who was sitting in his office one day when the telephone rang. The voice on the other end of the line said, Hi, Bill, is Joe there? Joe was the youth minister. Bill said, one moment, please, and put the caller on hold. He buzzed into Joe and said, the phone is for you. I forgot to ask who it is, but the voice sounded familiar. I'm sure it's somebody you know. I just, I just can't place her. After the phone call, Joe came to Bill and said, that voice that you didn't recognize was your wife. <laughs> Bill later said, I knew I had been busy, but I had no idea things were that bad. He said, actually, we had a bad phone connection, and that's my story, and I'm sticking to it. (laughs) Bill goes on to say, one of the keys to our successful marriage is her stubborn love in spite of me. Love never fails. Jesus forgave the adulterous woman in spite of her failures. He defended her in spite of her shortcomings. He loved her in spite of her sin. 
He's the embodiment of God's perfect, unconditional, agape love. And our job is to imitate that kind of love. Not only does Christ-like love see us through our flaws, but it also offers itself willingly for the good of the beloved. Christ's love is by nature sacrificial. A couple more application points. First of all, love meets the needs of others before it meets the wants of self. Don't tell people that Jesus loves them until you're ready to love them too. I could preach a dozen sermons on the subject of love, but one act of love on your part will communicate better than all the sermons that I'll ever preach. Second application, love leads people to Christ. Love leads people to Christ. Love is infectious. And in a world that is starved for love, if the church will learn this principle and be a loving community, it will draw people to Christ. The story is told of a preacher riding on a bus and a drunk comes stumbling on, sitting down right beside him. The preacher immediately took out his Bible and he began reading Scripture to the man. Then he announced to the drunk, Do you know that you're going to hell? The drunk said, Oh no, I got on the wrong bus again. The world needs to know it's going to hell, but the best way to lead the world away from hell is to show them how to get to heaven. It's not hitting them over the head with the word. It's doing a kind deed. It's it's loving them into the kingdom. We need to communicate a message of love, for love leads people to Christ. Love sees people for what they can become rather than what they are. The woman caught in adultery was, I'm guessing, a pitiful sight. I'm guessing I wasn't there. I would imagine tears were streaming down her face. I would imagine her hair is a mess. I would imagine... She looks guilty as she could be of the sin she had committed. I would imagine she had clothing half on and messed up. Yet Jesus looks at her and sees her for what she can become rather than what she currently is. Hear me as we close. In 1 Corinthians 6, the apostle paints this picture of what the church really is. He talks about how the wicked will not inherit the kingdom of heaven. And you can read 1 Corinthians 6 sometime. But but then he gives a long list of those who will not get into heaven. And this is probably not an exhaustive list. It's just it represents those lifestyle behaviors that are going to keep you out. They are the sexually immoral, the idolaters, the adulterers, the, the... the, the thieves, the greedy, the drunkards, the slandered, the swindlers. And then the Bible says, none of those, he says, will inherit the kingdom of God. And then he says, this is what some of you were. You have to define the you. It's written to Christians. It's written to the church. The first readers of that letter were Christians That is what some of you Christians were. You see, we are standing beside this woman who was caught in the act of adultery. We are sinners too. But then Paul says, talking about you, you Christians, you were washed. You were sanctified. You were justified in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ and by the Spirit of our God. That's the church. We're no different than the woman except, church, except we have been washed, we have been sanctified, and we have been justified in the name of Jesus 
and by the Spirit of God. And I personally, I want this church, Gearing Central, more than anything else. I want us to be a community of love. More than anything else, I want to be able to come here, and I want you to be able to come here and feel totally and completely loved. If we love each other as God has loved us, then we will become together the community of love that will serve like a magnet, drawing a world that is starving for love into the presence of Jesus and the salvation that he offers. Lord God, we're thankful for your love. God, help us to see people like you see people. God, help us to love like you have loved us. Thank you for preserving this story for us. The story that we can see a snapshot, see a picture of what love is. There's lots of voices in this world telling us what love is, and yet... I'm going to choose to believe what love is according to your word. God, help us to put on love. Help us to give out love. Help us to speak out against sin, but help us to love those that are committing those sins. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Would you stand with us this morning? We're going to sing through a chorus a couple times. An old chorus for God so loved the world. In your bulletins is a uh, bulletin insert. Um, these are, uh, Love Month is traditionally, uh, it's an outreach to Summer Christian College. Uh, they encourage uh, as many churches they can find uh, to support them, you know, a special love offering during, um, during February. That's their Love Month. And so we'll have, a, we'll have Jeffrey McKean coming over in a couple of weeks, then he'll, he'll speak and, and present the work of Summit Christian College. And and so it's, uh, it's just a good time to promote Summit Christian College as we think about uh, uh, that's one of the main missions that we support uh, on a monthly basis and, and that sort of thing. But this insert is, uh, is representative of some seminars that are offered free of charge. Um, they are on Thursday nights. They are at 6.30, and they are 45 minutes long. And they're taught by different professors over at the Bible College, and you can register online. Again, they're free. You can, you can attend and, and be in the seminar in person, or you can, they'll give you a Zoom ID number, and you could Zoom in and watch at home if you'd like. But uh, there's one, two, three, four, five different professors, and then I think um, Aaron Prose does some extra ones. But they're all Thursday night uh, at 6.30, starting this week on Thursday night with Scott Gribble doing a, a seminar on unlocking the parables. And so if you're uh, wanting to have some good, wholesome education here from professors at Selma Christian College, uh, these, these would be good seminars to attend. And so that's that. Um, Bags of Blessing is not in your bulletin, but there is a date set for February 17th at 10 a.m. There is a grocery list out in the foyer if you'd like to be a part of that. And also, you can smell the goodness. Stay, if you'd like, for a fellowship dinner uh, that we'll have out in the fellowship hall just, just shortly after our time here. God is good. All the time. We're just going to sing this little chorus as we go. We are one. Go 
of God. Have a great day.